People still trickling in, but we'll, we'll get started anyway. My name's uh, Jonathan Price. I'm a research fellow in the Melanesia program at the Lowy Institute. We're a, res we're an independent think tank um, focusing on international affairs based in Sydney. Um, we have, thanks everyone, it's, such, it's great to see such a great turnout for the end of a two day conference. Um, I'm sure everyone's a bit drained, but hopefully our three speakers today will reinvigorate us at the end. Yeah, we've, I've decided to switch the structure around a little bit so we can go from the macro down to the, the micro. And I'll introduce all of our speakers um, back to back so we can just rotate through and then we'll take questions at the end. Uh, so our first speaker will be Rup Singh. He's a senior lecturer at the University of South Pacific. I'm not going to give you their full background so just to allow plenty of time for presentation and questions. Uh, Dr. Singh will be speaking on Fiji's macroeconomy in the short to medium term. Our second speaker will be Asali Tuvela. Uh, he's a development manager at the Fiji National University. His, the title of his presentation will be Exploring the Disparity in SME Market Offerings in Fiji. And finally, we will have Rukmani Gounder, uh, a professor at the, of economics at the Massey University in, in New Zealand. She'll be talking on remittances and household consumption behavior, findings from Fiji. So, without further ado, I'll pass over to Rook and um, Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to USB and uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, I've, I've made a little correction to the topic. Uh, that is, uh, as you can see, it says the economy in the medium term. For one good reason, because I think most of us know where, where will PTB in the short term. It's not too hard to guess. We've got the ADB, uh, IMF, uh, Reserve Bank, even the government in the recent budget has made it quite clear uh, on the economic circumstances for the country in the short term. So I'll, I'll, not, um, I'll not go into details of short term stuff, but I want to be able to um, sort of uh, explain what I'm looking forward to in the medium term. Um, the highlights of my presentation, basically the Fiji's growth trajectory um, up to 2025, I want to be able to show um, whether this uh, growth rate that we will uh, just think it happen, uh, whether they will be persistent or not. And then interestingly, I want to be able to explore um, the recent phenomena of natural disasters, uh, the DC Winston I'm referring to, but uh, the, the analysis here excludes the effects of Winston because of data issues, but other than that, um, I'm thinking they on board. And some issues for consideration to policymakers. Obviously, the implications are listed here as this and we know why we're doing all this. Let me make a quote from this uh, Good Conditions paper by two eminent professors and, and of course, um, uh, literates. Um, nothing ever has or ever will uh, get people out of economic struggle and poverty but economic growth. Uh, I want to emphasize on growth because I don't think that there is anything serious um, left or will be left to get people out of poverty. And every good thing that we want in the SDGs and, and of course it's for some reason. Um, why is that? Well, let's assume we are sitting in a 300 level class. So um, I'm putting some numbers there to give you some perspective. Suppose per capita income is 7,500 Fijian, which is what according to Bureau of Stats is in 2014. And if it grew uh, persistently by 4% in the years up to 2025, we're looking at somewhere around $11,400 per person. In terms of international dollars, uh, IMF states that in 2015, Fiji's per income is 9,000. And at a growth rate of 4%, we're looking at 13,200 in 2025. What does that mean? Well, uh, we'd be enjoying um, the, the incomes and uh, livelihoods as in some other countries like Jordan, South and Africa, and the in the region. Just to give you some comparison as to why um, stable rates of growth is important. What is the implication of that? Um, with that kind of per capita income growing in, in about 19 years, we expect the welfare to improve around 40% by 2025, if, if this happens, which is a great outcome. I hope to see uh, many more happier Fijians in the room with this. <laughs> Now, growth in the short run. I've just uh, got it out from the Reserve Bank's 2015 um, quarterly review. And uh, if you look at it, we are expecting to get around um, around uh, 3 
percent, a little over three percent uh, in 2018. What is uh, interesting in that particular chart is that with the new government coming in 2006, there were a uh, few uh, plus and minuses in there, which is not unexpected, particularly it could have been, um, you know, given the economic circumstances we were in. But follow the, uh, the path since 2010. And um, I'm proud to say as a Fijian, we have recorded uh, good rates of growth, especially uh, expected around 2013 and 14. And uh, the projections for up to 2018, this is by the Reserve Bank, is that uh, the rates of growth will be positive and around 3%, which is not fair. Now, I, I tend to divide that into a longer time span and, of course, on uh, sub period. So if we look at the Fiji economy from 1995 to 2018, somewhere there, average rate of growth is 3.2, um, coefficient of variation 65, blind. Volatility is significant uh, from 1994 to 2015. If we do sub-periods, what are we looking at? 1995, 1999, average growth 3%, very high um, volatility, coefficient of variation 75. Average growth 2000 to 2005, 1.6 or 1.58, volatility is declining. That um, in the period 2006 to 2010, Lower average, but you can see volatility has declined even further. However, in 2012-2015, growth rate has picked up. And this is a serious pickup from a very low base. And uh, volatility has gone up. So what we see as what has happened in the past is that uh, we have seen uh, growth rates to have gone down um, seriously in every uh, five years. But then we see a rebound. So I'm expecting to, that the economy will catch on this rebound in, in the next few years, and then we can develop from there on. Now, I, I made some interpolations. I, I was sitting uh, back in Vanuatu before I came in here, so I had a lot of time. So I started exploring. I said, OK, this is what the Fiji economy has achieved in the past. Let me work out the trends, let me work out the productivity rates, let me foresee this in the future. So um, I have uh, three scenarios in front of you. The first one, okay, this is um, the pre-2006, the blue line is the business as usual before 2006. Okay, So if we had grown in the manner that we were growing before 2006, in 2025, we would get slightly over, is it two and a half? Yes. Yeah. Okay, slightly over two and a half. No serious progress, believe me. That rate of growth is nothing <coughs> surprising, excluding this even stand in the, in the middle end. Then we look at uh, the same time frame with uh, what the uh, what has happened after the, the 2006 change of government and all that. And the kind of policies that they, be, uh, they begin to bring in place, and if those policies can potentially improve productivity by 0.1%, okay, you would see that by 2023, we would have totally conversed, and after that, surpassed what we would have obtained um, using the usual business case before 2006. So that means that uh, things are looking better for the country. We will be slightly better in 2025, the projections uh, based on productivity and average rates of growth. However, the reality is that um, we've already passed 2015. And in 2016, there was this um, very cruel, I should say, this is means that impact in the economy. So whatever we are um, expecting may not materialize in the manner that we think they will. So let us, let us do that kind of analysis and see. So I start 2015, whatever the rate of growth was in 2015, I take it as a state point. So in this graph, which is right at the top, okay, we started where we are in 2015. We are affected by Winston, right? It's a negative shock, and it's a serious shock. But then we are also supported by our development partners in other countries. And so there is some positive stimulus coming in. We don't expect all the stimulus to be realized in 2016. So there's a proportion of which to be realized in 16, and then some in 17, by 18, most of it is gone. So um, 
With that in place, and with the assumption that the current policy framework is in place, and if it raises productivity by the same 1%, by 2025, we are looking at somewhere around just over 4%, 4.2%. And I don't think that is a bad prediction in the medium term. If I look at what IMF is saying and what ADB is saying, if I look at their reports, and what the next three years uh, rate of growth is for Fiji, 4.2 is not something that we cannot achieve. So let me make a little clarification on that. Um, the, the rate of growth that we realized in 2015, of course, it comes with some volatility. So even if we adjust for the volatility in this particular period, 2025, by 0.7 on average, so we're looking at uh, 3.5 minimum and uh, 4.9 maximum. So that's where I think the economy will, will head um, in some years to come. The findings were a bit, a bit surprised me. I, I thought whether we can potentially get there. But I think we can. In, nine, in, in um, I think uh, it was 1989 when the garment industry was first started, yes, we hit 8.9% growth. So that kind of maximum 5.2 uh, is, is not something that we can achieve. Provided that we maintain our same policy framework <coughs> even better. We, we look into um, raising the productivity rates. Now, I then start to explore why can we get the system. Look at the investment rates. I'm, I got these figures from RBF this morning. It's about uh, just over 20%, which is not bad. If investment rises further, it's good. But the good thing is that we are depending more on domestic investment than on the net FDI. Look at rate performance up to 2014. Things seem to have improved, but the recent data, which I also obtained, which I could not put in here, implies that there is a drop in exports. Um, so there is something that, that we need to look into uh, as, an, as an economy. Look at uncertainty in the financial market. I've got inflation rates down here, and it, it shows me since that time, 2011, there is a serious um, decline in inflation rate, which is not a bad thing. Real effective exchange rate more or less remains stable. Of course, there is like up and down, but they more or less remain stable. It provides a good environment for uh, investment decisions. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed that um, we, can, we can get that kind of rate. Look at government's capital expenditure as a ratio of total expenditure of the government. Uh, in 2014, it was around 30%. And in the 2016 17 budget, the government has stated that they will maintain a very high capital, um, uh, capital to uh, government expenditure ratio. Look at government's health and education. This is a sad story um, down here, but mm. on average, it has been maintained well. Now, what are the implications of this? Outlook for the economy is positive, but we need certainty in policies, because that's important for business and consumption, uh, consumer's confidence. Um, they will need to shift away from wealth financing to growth uh, promotion. And that is, a uh, bit of that is implied in the national budget 2016 and 17. We need more investment spending in other sectors if you want to realize broad-based growth. I think the government is looking to broad-based growth. Um, the stock of capital and level of technology must increase. Labor productive, uh, productivity got to rise. <coughs> when I looked at the employment projection for Fiji by the Reserve Bank, um, it looks that employment, uh, they are employment prospects and this rising. But how will we manage this, this particular challenge? Um, of course, we want broad-based growth, like um, any investor who would want to have uh, broad investment uh, portfolios. The economy is also looking into broad-based growth, but I think there is scope that we deepen um, you know, uh, the growth prospects for selected sectors, which are high-impact sectors, like tourism. Tourism has the potential to rebound quickly. Agriculture is also very, very important because majority of our people are tied into this sector, those living in the rural areas. So there's, a, there's scope for us to go deeper into this, although um, I, I do support the idea of broad-based economic growth. We need to fix structural problems that affect our exports. We have um, dwelled on uh, exchange rate devaluation, which has helped, no doubt. That's why we've seen a uh, rebound in exports. But I think in order to see more exports and to counter the negative uh, trade balances, 
we need to fix the two problems in the export sector. We need to develop capacity in people to reduce their vulnerabilities and dependence on government and other uh, entities. Okay, I think uh, as, as we can develop that, uh, it, ca it can improve our livelihoods. There's obviously a role of the government and others to amplify what private sector can do for us. We are looking at investment ratio, which is around 20, 25, probably 28. But I think over 30% is what, what is much more desirable. Reforms uh, must proceed to rise productivity and to give clear signals out there to the market and market participants like investors. Um, and in the medium term, as the economy progresses, government should um, do away with relying on debt financing. Now, what is the impact of natural disasters? I benefited from this SPC uh, SOPEC data that helps us to quantify uh, the impact of disasters over time from 1980 to 2015. So what I did was I estimated the effects of that on the world of Fiji. Uh, I've been doing this uh, without estimates and all that for some time. So I thought, why not let's, let's try and, and see what we would get. So what I did was I estimated its impact on productivity and therefore on the rate of growth. You find that any uh, another disaster uh, of an average kind that, that we get or that we have been getting from 1980 to 2015 has the potential to reduce uh, animal rate of growth by 35 basis points. However, TC Winston would have reduced it by much further. Now let's let's put that into some perspective. Give me one more minute, Jeff. Um, the, the estimated impact of a political disturbance of the nature of 1987 is around 40 basis points. So the disasters uh, that Fiji has been experiencing, natural disasters of whatever kind recorded in the database, has the potential to impact growth rate by a similar magnitude. Uh, out of interest, I also was able to estimate the impact of the coup on other macro vehicles, like uh, on private investment, negative impact, twice as much in the long run than in the short run, on demand for money, 25 basis points, uh, on exports and imports, around 20, 30 basis points negatively, and on price level, five basis points. Um, these are serious impact of, of such, such thing like uh, who? So is it an annual one-off or permanent? It's it's one-off. One who is one-off? <laughs> yeah, I'll just wrap, wrap it up here. Okay. Um, so I think we're still vulnerable to supply-side shocks, and the impact of these things are significant. Um, of course, we can't afford another political problem in the country. So what do we need to do is to invest in smart technology for the utilities, infrastructure, ICT, communications development. We need to develop different types of skills in people, maybe after school classes <coughs> or sessions, um, support innovations and entrepreneurship, reduce uncertainty in policy, and manage market risks and support business development. So in conclusion, I should say that Fiji has made some progress in the last uh, recent past. Um, we project that uh, the short term growth would be around three, but from the medium term, we're looking at slightly over four, could possibly end up close to five. And we can achieve that through productivity growth, uh, supporting the right kind of investment and private sector development, and by eliminating or mitigating the negative shocks that we can potentially uh, see from these other events. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rod. Um, yeah, I think uh, any most country, other countries in the Pacific, including Australia, will be envious of that kind of medium-term prospect. So you cover a lot of ground in 15 minutes. Thanks very much. We'll move straight into the second session. That's you. Uh, very much uh, 
more of an academic presentation. And I consider myself as an emergent researcher. So I said it in such a way to help those who may be in, uh, or, you know, doing research, basically in terms of the process and how to reach the destination in terms of getting data collection as well as the research funding. <coughs> now, exploring uh, the disparity on SME market offering is more about hearing the voices of SMEs who are on the ground. Uh, in the last session that we had over here, we had a very good deal, uh, discussion and uh, Dr. Sunil uh, raised about the mismatch in training as well as uh, those who are looking for employment. And uh, here we are going to just focus on uh, SMEs in terms of the sport services. And I also look at some of the experiences in the international uh, market uh, to confirm some of the work surrounding the, uh, the problem that I want to pursue here. Uh, I also want to just uh, read the scheme over the approach and methodology again as part of the process and I also looking at the key findings and the conclusion. I want to begin by stating that uh, <coughs> this work really uh, came out from a doctoral research that uh, I did last year. And uh, so a lot of the findings really uh, is part of that uh, work. The thesis that I want to make here is uh, SME sports services are not working in the context of Fiji. And it may be uh, pretty bad when you look at the small possible outcomes because of the lack of resources, the technical, the technical expertise are not there, and the support systems are not well advised when you compare it with other developed and developing countries. Now, what is really support services? Um, I bring in two components here, and uh, I'm just looking at the, the concept of support services. <coughs> the two components here are support services and assistance programs. So support services, you're talking about consultancy, market research, accounting and legal counseling, mentoring, uh, networking, and uh, <coughs> those kind of uh, support that are needed to help businesses at the beginning of the journey or when they want to expand their businesses. When you look at assistance programs, we're talking about those who are looking at um, infrastructure development, such as new venture capital, uh, small business finance, export and trade facilities, letter of credit, grant funding, and uh, so forth. And the nature of the support really will depend on the need. And uh, this is a word that uh, <coughs> will come out in this um, particular presentation is the fact that the need of those who are seeking for support services or assistance programs are not well captured by those who are designing and delivering sport programs on the ground. That is a statement that uh, I'm <coughs> making in here. And uh, when you talk about uh, support, there are two types. One is the public support. And, uh, this government, uh, Fiji government, is uh, quite famous in providing support services for the SME um, owners and also those who are uh, wanting to start business. And uh, there's a lot of experience on the ground here in Fiji. And I'm sorry to say that a lot of those experiences uh, did not really come out well. And uh, there's a saying that goes here, small businesses born today for a burden tomorrow. Okay. In terms of uh, private uh, support, we include uh, financial institutions, accountants, lawyers, uh, business advisors, <coughs> investors, and uh, managed care centers and business incubators, something that, uh, again, I, uh, I think one of the, the regional organizations tried to do this program here some years ago, I think in 2003, tried to establish this program called Business Incubation, and uh, to date I don't know whether we managed to come out of it or whatever the lessons that we've learned, it's still hazy at this moment. Now, the idea of uh, support is uh, increasing. Uh, there is this thinking 
again by the so-called experts that there is a strong correlation between SME growth and national income, employment, as well as GDP growth. So I, if you look at whatever has been spent on the ground here, the, the words of uh, Professor Helen News some years ago, there's over 50 million have been pumped into the Pacific Islands, and uh, as of today, we still continue to hit <coughs> the same problems of bad governance, poor economic performance, the very, very minimal growth. So that has never evaded us. So what I'm uh, saying here that the government is uh, moving and trying to help in developing programs, but it's not really making headway. <coughs> I said at the beginning that the, the source of uh, support governments have built packages again to support those who are wanting to start as well as those who are already in the existing business. Yesterday the director ADB mentioned about about the mismatch in the training and demand and uh, a lady was here before the session and she was very passionate about uh, the fact that the universities are churning out graduates and are unable to find employment. And that is really similar to the same problem that is now we are facing here in the SME industry. So we have all sorts of programs and most of which are what I call template solutions uh, that have been imported and tried to be adapted here into this country and we don't seem to be able to adapt it well. Uh, I will uh, be talking about some of uh, the reasons as to why some of these problems didn't really work. Yeah, this is the real I just came over this. This is some of the, the experiences that I looked at. Uh, in UK, UK is very big. SME is very big in terms of the development. They have built this uh, thing called business link <coughs> networks. And I think this is the, the time of Margaret Thatcher. So one of the things uh, that we uh, looked at again, this, uh, it came out from a study by this guy, David Birch, uh, about uh, the growth in the economy uh, because of the innovation creativity in uh, business. I also look at the Afri African experience. There's a guy here who looked at a uh, number of organizations in Africa and he said, because of the differences in tribal language, the culture, and the environment, the geography, it's very, very <coughs> difficult to be able to import any solutions that are developed outside of the country and to try and uh, do it on the ground. That's really what we got. Again, in Australia, the same thing, and uh, the World Bank. And uh, in a nutshell, there are three kind of, uh, uh, the three uh, kind of, uh, uh, findings that are emerging from this experience. First, the increase in the use of support services, and that really shows or implies the uh, value that the SME owners um, attribute to support services. Uh, second, <coughs> the market of uh, support services seem to be skewed towards uh, private service providers. There's a bit of a hesitancy for those seeking for support to go to government for a number of reasons. One of which is they don't really trust the advice given by public officers. And also they don't really see any value of using the support that are given by the government. And uh, thirdly, there's a uh, there's a, a kind of a profusion of support even now in the Pacific Islands. There's a lot of programs going on. Now, this, well, some years ago, microfinance came here. Yeah, and I can stand here boldly and say that microfinance is a failure for this uh, country. Why? Because we are trying to emulate something that was done in that country, but the attitude, the behavior, the passion of people in this country is totally different from there. And that's why it won't work. And, uh, I've got five more minutes. Now let me just look at uh, some of the, i just skip this. This is for those who are just doing it. 
Let's just look at some of the many findings uh, here. One of the things that I found in the, this particular work is there is really a disconnect between the reach of those signal systems and the nature of certain port services. This what implies the needs of those who want to start a business, either they are not captured by those who are deciding support services, or if they have been captured, they are inadequately covered in the deciding mechanism. And thus leading to a mismatch or disconnection. And at the end of the day, we have <coughs> inappropriate, ineffective, irrelevant support programs that are given to small businesses for the sake of starting a business. And you know what? what's happening here in this country? The 1,000 offerings, people are running for the money. They want money. They don't want to start business. Why? Because they do not have the passion. They do not have it. They want money because they do not have uh, income. They need employment. So at the end of the day, we are only attracting uh, people who can access the funds because of the social networks, but they are the wrong, the wrong kind of people to be giving support. And uh, the other thing is the educated, uh, inadequate planning and preparation business that are, again, two uh, guys, I think uh, uh, Kumar was probably involved in this uh, some years ago about uh, cooperatives here in uh, Fiji. And uh, the paper that uh, wrote really came out, and also something that I picked out from this uh, uh, research, the fact that the uh, people are coming for assistance and they say that they're not well prepared. But the question is, why did they go there in the first place? Why did they see the funds if they are not well prepared? So we can most probably, because of the push into the program, here is 1,000, so a lot of people are going for it, or because of political <coughs> reasons. So those are some of the things that are coming out from this uh, research. In a, nutshell, in a nutshell, the message that I really want to post here is the fact that in order to be effective, in order to be appropriate, in order to be relevant, you need to understand some of the things that are going in terms of the social cultural conditions of the country. And some of these are very, very relevant when decisions are made with regards to entrepreneurship development. If when we underestimate it, then problems begin to arise. And it's, it's not unique to Fiji, it's common in a lot of uh, South Pacific Island countries. And also, there's a really need of uh, having context specific, uh, specific support programs and assistance that will really match the needs of those seeking assistance. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And, um, and the time as well, that's fantastic. So. We're going to keep delving down into the, the micro here. Um, we'll move straight into with money and uh, hear about uh, the limits. Thank you. everyone. Uh, I'm Rukmini, although I'm attached to Massey University in, <coughs> in New Zealand, but I do come from Fiji. I, my home is from, I'm from originally from Nandi. So I'm quite uh, interested in uh, much of the work on the island nations and of course remittance has been one of the issues that many of the islands do receive quite a bit of remittances. So uh, I was talking to uh, Fiji Islands Bureau of Statistics who gave us some data on the latest Fiji's uh, household expenditure, income and expenditure survey. So the results that I will be presenting today is looking at basically the remittances and the actual impact on each and every <coughs> expenditure pattern that uh, Fiji has in terms of the consumption, uh, over, uh, uh, particularly in that particular uh, year. So remittances, we of course have been hearing for the last uh, two days that it is a really important source of income to finance household uh, particularly the livelihood. We know that is the source of income that comes out from families that are there and I am one of them who send money home. So definitely this becomes much more passion to see whether what sort of impact it does have on the livelihood of the people or does it benefit in their consumption patterns over, over that time. So of course we also know that by increasing income 
the incipient uh, households, of course, uh, contribute to welfare, and that is something that we have been hearing. But the categories that I will be looking at is looking at a range of durable and non-durable goods, food, housing, education, <coughs> health. But of course, there is small and medium entrepreneurial activities, savings, and uh, uh, poverty reduction. But this last three categories, small, medium, scale enterprise, and also savings and poverty reduction, that part is not uh, included in the analysis here. First of all, the, the small, and, uh, small scale enterprise, that data was not available, uh, because that was the question not inbuilt in the survey questionnaire. And, and I, I will not touch on to the last two parts in this work. Uh, so this expenditure, of course, is supposed to improve the standard of living. It also gets them to earn higher income if it's part of that uh, uh, progression for the household. And also it does play a very important role in the community development as well. Now, basically, of course, like I said, looking at the Fiji's household income and expenditure survey, and of course, with remittances, Fiji is saving a large amount of remittances as well. Uh, it is, uh, of course, very useful to draw some kind of implications based on the role of economic and social development in this particular perspective. Um, before I talk about the model, I just wanted to put it in perspective, the theories that we've been hearing about, oh, which is related to remittances, is why do people actually remit? What is pure altruism? We want to all look after our families, so we want to uh, we send money over to do that. It's also self-interest, uh, me sending home uh, money maybe for a particular reason, for my interest, is also for the family as well. And also for family uh, agreement as well, usually for uh, me to go and study overseas, my parents would have uh, borrowed money, so they sent uh, me away. So I could also, of course, pay back. So that is a family uh, 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 agreement that is there as well. And portfolio management decision is, of course, linked to any investment or asset uh, that I would develop. The, from the recipient's perspective, you can see remittances are also important to the families because it increases the income of the household. To the companies that uh, tra transmit them, we have heard about uh, MTOs, the money transfer organizations and the banks, they make profit. Nations that send them, it's political aspect as well, so there's a link of political linkages. Uh, particularly uh, Australia and New Zealand with the Pacific Islands, so that's also part of political and also cultural and, uh, you know, the, the links that are there. And nations that receive that, it's more for their economic and social development. So basically, importance of remittances we have seen in the developing countries from the theoretical perspective, from macro side, is foreign exchange earning, savings, investment, but from micro side, of course, household uh, consumption improves, standard of living improves, and also poverty will uh, reduce as well. There's a whole series of this literature which is there, which I'm not going to talk, but what I want to say, that studies have looked at some of these issues in the case of uh, India, Pakistan, Mexico, Latin, a lot of Latin American countries, World Bank is uh, heavily involved in uh, uh, looking at Latin American countries because of the corridor between uh, Latin American countries and the United States. There's a vast uh, flow of remittances over a period of time as well. So that is one key reason a lot of studies have been done. But we are starting in the Pacific part, and because I could get a handle of uh, Fiji's data set, so I thought I could uh, look at this uh, in terms of the e household level to see the impact. Now, another very interesting aspect is that uh, South Pacific labor movement. Now, we've been talking about it. Are we against migration or not? Uh, well, educated labor force has always moved, even though now there is an unskilled labor at a lower level. We have seen through the seasonal worker scheme in terms of in New Zealand and also SWP in terms of the Australian one as well. Now, I will just touch on the, the uh, just to want to let you know that if you look at this data set, in 2000, eight of the top 10 countries with the highest rate of educated labor force. So this is a very important point here. The particularly the tertiary educated immigrants in East Asia and the Pacific are actually from Samoa. You can see 75.4%. Tonga, 75%. Fiji, 62%. So you can see that a lot of skilled labor are moving. We can hear the passion in what 
uh, Sunil uh, uh, presented on that, and then also why the skin labor move. Well, there are all sorts of reasons, as we know, but uh, I won't dwell on those uh, aspects as well. Uh, I won't touch on, uh, discuss much about that. In the last two days, we have seen a lot of uh, remittances for the share of GDP, and this is the comparison. And of course, we know that Tonga used to receive quite, uh, is the high, used to be the highest uh, recipient uh, GDP share uh, earning country, but now, of course, some uh, yeah, is, has taken over, but Fiji is much lower within ranging, you can see, between sort of like six, seven, six percent to almost four to five percent uh, in the period 2014 around here. Uh, of course, Solomon Islands and uh, of course uh, Vanuatu are picking up, and of course the seasonal workers from these countries are also part of that uh, big continent. Now, just to give you an idea in terms of the, the household income that we have had over a period of time, uh, this is the household income and expenditure survey that uh, Fiji Island Bureau of Statistics data has provided. The, this year, they had uh, into, uh, the number of households included 3,573 households that were there. So it's a very huge data set in terms of uh, the sort of the people that are there, what are their income, what is the expenditure, the categories of expenditure, expenditure on health, education, housing, all of that is there as well. So you can see this is the total number of households that spends on food, housing, uh, this is durable and non-durable goods, health and education, and you can see the percentage of those people who receive remittances and I managed to then also bring a group which also has no recipient recipi uh, recipients and look at how they spend that money on food, agriculture, uh, food, housing, uh, durable, non-durable goods, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't want to spend much time here, but this gives you an idea of the split of in terms of the number of households that were surveyed and the number of households that received recipients. Uh, sorry, remittances were 1,104 compared to in that same survey of 3,533, 2,469 are non recipients. Uh, I won't spend any more time in that, much as I would love to have done that, but never mind. Uh, let's look at uh, a little bit more meaningful stuff. Now, looking at the disaggregation in here, now uh, the first column which shows in here is how many of the rural recipients you can see, uh, sorry, urban recipients receive their, uh, I mean, spend money on their food. Now what I wanted to show, if you look at the urban non-recipients, <coughs> they spend more on food. And the rural recipients of the remittances are this bar, which is almost 46% in here, compared to the rural non-recipients, they spend more. So once again, you can see what I'm trying to, uh, this picture is portraying, is basically that non-recipients do tend to spend more money on that. So that is that level of income which they don't receive in terms of remittances, but their expenditure is there high uh, as well. Now if you look at housing, it's a similar thing as well. The, the, the urban recipient households do tend to actually have in terms of high expenditure as well, but you can see much lower rates uh, are in, the lowest rate is in health, and then in education there is much higher as well. So this gives us a picture of how we can do that. Now I brought this equation not to scare you all, but to make sure you all are awake. Now this is a model that is used, I just want to just show that, uh, that whatever the, the results we see will be linked to this particular model. I won't talk about this model at all. Now methodology as well, believe me, I've uh, done a bit of econometrics and the hair is getting gray, so the econometric modeling is correct. Uh, okay, uh, now you can see, oh, I think this is the result I want to talk about. Now if you look at uh, what I did, I looked at all the households first, and you can see that in the case of Fiji, there is a positive correlation between the expenditure of food of the total household, although it's not significant like the star that is shown, but it is still positive. So a bit of money is spent by all total household on food. Some houses are in Mexico and others, they don't spend so much, but in Fiji's case, it, it is there. Now in the housing, it is positive and significant. So the households 
do spend uh, uh, money, saving money, mm. do improve their housing, not so much on durable and non-durable goods. Now you can see if they're spending, reducing more in some area, they're spending more in others. So education is very important. We want to have this human capital development, and you can see remittances does go in terms of uh, <coughs> expenditure, to, uh, which improves the education level of the children in the households. And also, interestingly, you can see health has got a positive correlation with the remittances as well. Now, what I did, I looked at in terms, sorry, the, the color did not come here, but this is for Fijians and this is for the Indo-Fijian. Now, you can see in the Fijians case, more money remittances goes in the housing and also in, in the case of the no Indo-Fijians as well. But in durable, non-durable, that's where they reduce the money, but they spend both the groups, Fijians and Indo-Fijians, they do improve children's education. Our expenditure goes into the children's education for them, and that is really very encouraging indeed. But in the Indo-Fijians case, there's a bit of more money uh, also allocated towards the health sector as well. Now what I did, I split the results and looked at urban uh, regions and then the rural areas separately. Now, in terms of total urban, once again, you can see that in the urban areas, the money goes into the housing sector. Fijians also spend more towards that uh, in the, put in the uh, uh, urban areas for the housing. But in the Indo, the Indo Fijians, there is a positive correlation, though not totally significant, but it is still there's some level of significance here as well. But once again, you can see all these are where the money is not going in this area, but interestingly, money does go, uh, the urban households, they put it into edu uh, education. It is a positive correlation with the Fijian households and a significant <coughs> and, uh, correl uh, correlation particularly <coughs> improves the education for the households uh, of the Indian, uh, Indo-Fijian households. But you can see health, the urban sectors do don't tend to put so much in there, but there is a positive correlation for the Fijian households in here. Now, let's look at rural sector. This is, a, a, again, a very important area where bulk of our people live, and also particularly most of them associated with the agriculture sector. Now, if you look at in total rural areas, once again, there are positive. So in rural areas, more money does go towards the food and the housing, though not significant. And you can once again see in education, it is picking up in terms of all households. But in the indo fijian you can see it goes into the food in the rural area and in education. And in the Fijian households, more goes into the education and, and, and a little bit uh, towards the uh, the health as well. So this gives us some idea in terms of looking at the actual expenditure of the household that received the money. Where does it go to? So it tells us a very good story in terms of that as well. Now results basically highlight the potential influence of remittances uh, 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 of the household towards their expenditure. But uh, interestingly, you can see Sorry, on the contrary, uh, uh, the belief basically is that remittances are mostly used for food consumption, but results for Fiji suggest basically that remittances are, have alternative uses in the particular households as well. Uh, and you can see education and uh, health uh, housing is key uh, aspect of that. Urban areas, you can see Indo-Fijian households have used more income, and rural areas, of course, you can see the more goes towards the education expenditure. What, can, what sort of implications we can draw, based, uh, draw basically from this finding is that, that households do tend to put more in productive uses. I would have loved to have seen whether it goes to do small and uh, medium scale enterprises, particularly in the agriculture sector, but that was not available. I mean, that question was not asked by Bureau of Statistics. So that is something we can suggest for their next uh, next survey, they uh, do that when another five years or so. Now, it actually applies that uh, at the slow that food expenditure are increasing function of income and uh, family size. Now, we do have a big, big family size. I didn't put that there, but you can see that our food budget share actually decreases in the mm -hmm. households yeah. as the income increases in Fiji. So that that is an interesting uh, uh, finding as well, or implication we can see. Also, remittances assist households to improve and maintain the uh, livelihood, and I think that is very important. And that 
ultimately also says it can also reduce poverty uh, of those households that receive remittances as well. <coughs> Uh, policies should be aimed at supporting improved agriculture skills. I think that production, particularly skill, vocational training, and rural infrastructure. This is something which uh, the next step will look at to see how the rural sector uh, uh, aspect of remittances can be used. So, haven't done the analysis yet, but that would be the next bit that can be uh, thought about as well. Again, I think government will have to play a very important role. Uh, they are encouraging about remittances, so cost of remittances has to decrease. Of course, uh, there's a lot of informal uh, remittances that come which is not captured in here. Uh, I come to Fiji, I bust and brought cash and given it to my family. So that never gets into that balance of payment that says the reserve bank will say, look, money brought uh, $5,000 and gave it to somebody. I didn't bring 5000 <laughs> But uh, to give you an idea. So I think these are some of the things that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, more information technology link the remittances to the household and other financial schemes, I think, are very important. So then we can also capture uh, savings into that and also credit for productive investment in housing. A lot of people talk about those issues, but we have not yet seen that. So this sort of work can be uh, included to improve uh, the uh, uh, economic and social development. Thanks for playing. That, um, that was fascinating. It's really interesting to see how um, spending behavior is, yeah. the change in spending behavior is really That's marginal, right? right? It all just yeah. rises together. That's, That's fascinating. Mm. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions. I'll uh, just ask everyone to introduce themselves with, um, and then keep their questions brief and limit themselves to one question each. Uh, and please uh, press the button on the microphone and speak into the microphone for the recording. I will take, we'll do it in clusters, groups of three. Um, and so, yeah, over, over to the floor. <coughs> Who'd like to get started? Manoj. So, um, thank you, uh, Jodo. Um, my question is uh, to Lukmini. Um, so, if I understood your model correctly, I think it's a log log uh, yes. model. Right? So, this means that uh, coefficient of 0 0.009 means um, almost 0 0.9. So, for every yeah. thousand. Uh, Every dollar increase. Yeah, so it's a nine point 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 nine percent. Point nine. Point nine percent. This is very small, actually. Well, the remittances are not as large as that that you would think that it will have an impact. But if it making an impact with some significance level, it's good enough for the start right. because that is the amount which we don't only can capture how much is come through the normal formal channel. Mm -hmm. There are also informal channels as well. We might just say for oh, sorry, my answers are for the end. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, the second part is like I, I was, I was not sure like if I see the rural Fijian um, households have negative and significant uh, effect on health. Mm. Why it is? It, it, it looks contrary, it, but I mean, okay. you might have some explanation. Yeah. And the third part. Oh, come on, Manoj. <laughs> third part. Uh, my food share uh, decreases with increase in the income. I mean, I just, I'm just curious about the reason, if you have. Thanks. Great. So we'll, we'll just take two more questions and then jump back. So, <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Dev, I'm Bokanyo Deputy Nova ADMI. My question is for Dr. Tibekua about SME Sport. Uh, SME Sport, you mentioned the SME Sport program uh, decided by not SME demands, but external influence. Would you explain this in detail? And uh, do you think uh, uh, what are most important challenges for SMEs in Fiji from SME's point of view? How to solve this challenge? What policies are necessary for this challenge? Thank you. Uh, my, quest my question relates to uh, the remittances paper. Um, I'm interested to know if Brookmani's got any insights into whether remittances are driven by a desire to improve uh, standards of living uh, on the part of uh, recipients, or they're driven uh, by need, say, many. Uh, uh, household disasters, grandma gets ill, or uh, somebody needs uh, money for school uniform and school fees. Uh, because that would obviously have implications yeah. for the amount of money that comes in and how the money is going to be used. So how reactive are remittances? Yeah. 
So we'll stop there and we'll go go to the um, the panel. Um, so Rukmani, you want to start? Manoj's okay. questions and yeah. then the reactivity of yeah. Manoj, um, I think I answered your first one. You said uh, in terms of the Fijian households, the health uh, in decreases. I mean, what we're saying that if it is so where there is a significant decrease in the expenditure in health, you'll see that some other component increases. So in the household sector, you'll see basically that they put more money towards the housing and more money towards education. So a little bit declined in terms of the, but significantly declined, that is 0.01% to every $1. So what they do, they have this share of in total income, say $1, they put certain 50 cents into education and another 49 cents in uh, in uh, housing, but maybe one cent only towards the education, uh, health. So that is why you will see a slight negative decline. So that is that share which says which component increases through remittances. So that's the explanation for that. Now, increase in income and remittance share decline. Now, in this is the amount of income which is, we are just, testing the share of remittances that came into the household, not the total income in this particular one. So we want to then see, so that is why you see that increase or decrease in that column in terms of the the, the expenditure part of it. That's the only reason. So that here. But you can't, I didn't, I, you cannot just bring the whole total income into that. Just wanted to see the impact of remittances on the household. So that is the reason why. Uh, make a definitely very interesting question. Definitely now we have talked also at the grassroots level in terms of looking at the household's expenditure and what they feel. But looking at this 2008-2009, uh, yes, remittances is supposed to improve the standard of living, reduce poverty, and so education might be a better uh, expenditure share where they want to do put in. Some households find it very hard, particularly in the rural areas. And what we also did in this the, 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 this, the part of the results I did not present here, is in terms of looking at the education for the girls and the boys in the rural and the urban and the, and also in terms of the Fijian and Indo-Fijian as well. So interesting results, but uh, it does have some place, some regions it does work, some way it doesn't. And because they have got that limited small share, how much do they put in housing or how much if they want to put it in health or education? But definitely a way out there. Yeah. Um, Sally, you want to address the question on yeah. what are the ex external influences on SME policy and what are the major challenges to SMEs? Yes, uh, let's, let's just take the financial institutions. You look at the products and services that are offered by this large bank, a lot of these come from outside or so externally imported. And uh, you don't really see the input of SMEs <coughs> into this program, and also where the, the voice of SMEs to carry them in consultation. And perhaps there's something that's missing here, the consultation between banks and SMEs. And when they do come into play, you see that the banks put up other conditions that tend to discriminate the SMEs in terms of raising their voice, their needs and their demand. Now, in terms of some of the challenges, uh, the biggest challenge here is understanding the business. And a case where I found one of the SMEs said, no banks understand about lending, but they don't understand business. And uh, I say this because I used to work in a bank for almost 10 years, and that's exactly what I do. I'm just more interested <coughs> in the uh, rules that are guidelines, and I just use that. And understanding the market, where they sell, I'm least be concerned. At the end of the, after for one month, I must ensure that this SME is repaid the loan. Uh, the other thing is uh, consultation. And uh, I guess even in a forum like this, we hardly see SMEs represented. And uh, they are just there doing, uh, just not, Presence. Their presence in forums like this is vital, and that is solely missing in the, some of uh, the development work in SMEs. Do you want to add anything to this room? 
Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to clarify to Manoj as to why the share of mm. consumption should decline when remittances would go up. Uh, for two reasons, when remittances are, are, are obtained into the households in Fiji, say, mm. due to the exchange rate, the absolute dollar amount Not would be reasonably large. Mm. Suppose it comes from Australia or US, um, or from New Zealand as well. So the pool of income gets amplified, where consumption isn't changed a lot, given what mm. one is trying to say. Mm. So that share declines because the denominator goes up. Mathematically, that's the answer. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we'll go to a new, another round. We'll do three again. So I've got three on the side. Um, I see more in the corner, so we'll do another round after. I'll go to Matt first. Uh, thank you. So Matt Dillon from the Regional Policy Centre. Um, like Manoj, I have a two-part question. Uh, but I did have just a very quick um, point of clarification. A convener, Matt. Uh, <laughs> apologies, apologies. So my questions are for Rook, but before I ask them, I did just want to um, ask a um, point of clarification for the money. Um, I was unclear about the whether or what control variables you use in your model, so I was interested whether income is actually controlled for, because otherwise I would assume that is what is driving that. Mm. Results with no. in terms of the food um, Excellent. expenditure yeah. on food. Um, so just that was a point of clarification. Um, but for Rook, um, uh, you talked about um, the vulnerability of the Fiji economy to shocks and so forth. Uh, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on the implications of that um, for the government in terms of its fiscal <coughs> stance, um, and uh, do you think that the current stance of the government uh, is appropriate um, given that? Uh, that risk of uh, natural disasters here in Fiji. Um, and secondly, I was a bit surprised at your, um, if I understood you correctly, um, I thought you said that the productivity impacts of natural disasters are fairly equivalent to those of political shocks. And then that struck me as a, a bit surprising, given that, um, I guess, in, in terms of growth impacts, at least, uh, a um, natural disaster is a one-off event. Um, and you typically expect the next year for economic growth to increase quite significantly due to new construction and so forth. That doesn't happen with political uh, instability, and often political instability affects the lasting over a number of years. Um, Fiji is recovering now, but it took quite a few years for growth to get back on track after 2006. Right. So I just hope you could get my elaborate on that. There's three questions, Matt. Yes. <laughs> um, we'll just go right next door. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, this is uh, <coughs> for uh, Dr. Ruth Singh. You know, there is a point that is of a little bit controversial nature. Is I don't see any government representative is here. <laughs> 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 you um, raised the point. There should be a shift away from welfare enhancing in one of your slides, earlier slides, to growth-oriented expenditure. Uh, we know <coughs> uh, the latest uh, Brexit result showed that globalization of uh, efforts promoted a few people in the economy. That is one of the reasons, of course. The another reason is the youth group did not vote in enough number. The people who are above 65 voted that we must get out of this so-called globalization and sharing with 27 other countries the better uh, skills and other aspects of the UK economy. We know that in Fiji is not that. It has been going on. It's not the Brexit <coughs> lesson is learned by this government. Fiji has grown last four to five years a positive growth about 3.5 or 4 percent. So it is very well known that the gains have come in terms of growth, GDP. So if the government has decided to have some welfare schemes, we cannot question. It is an aspect of political economy. So that's the problem with pure economists will say more growth is needed, certainly more development is needed. Growth is not in putting on weight. It has to be spread all over. Not that I am not defending 
but I'm looking at the global aspects of sharing the gains from what we are we are going to have it our new US election will now show it is not the Republicans who are now popular. It is because the financial crisis was brought in by financial institutions and the day on which the AIG insurance they celebrated a huge uh, blowout next day after. We know that story. Yeah. So this is something which I want to bring to the notice that economists are here to jump to the conclusion. We have to look into the political economy aspects. So growth versus welfare. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Great point. Thank you. And uh, we'll just, Stephen, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, thank you. I also wanted to ask uh, Rup about his paper, which I thought was very interesting and positive. But you had some comment right on the last slide, right? That somehow it depended on the political, on the politics. And um, I mean, I don't know if this is something you were able to comment on. But that was a, it would be good just to, for you to expand on that and to, to what extent uh, you think Fiji does have now a sort of stable, <coughs> stable political underpinnings for growth. Because ultimately, you need these kind of growth numbers for 10 to 20 years if you're really going to make an impact on poverty. Right. Okay, we'll go back to the panel. We've got a few to cover up. So. Okay. Um, uh, well, let me take one at a time. Uh, I think um, uh, I have four questions to answer. So uh, let's start from the political angle first and the end yeah. um, So the question is, is the political situation stable enough to see that kind of a projection of uh, slightly over 4% rate of growth? I feel that um, elections coming in 2018, if uh, the political situation changes, then probably we'll see a different um, outcome, obviously. But what I'm trying to say is that even if there is a change in government, uh, but if the policy framework remains in place, which, which provides the stable environment which we're somewhat seeing now, um, after the last uh, two to three years of what the government has been doing, if that continues, then obviously you'll see that kind of uh, result come to into five. So um, that's on that. Um, let me move to Professor's question on the welfare against growth. Um, we can argue whole day on this. But um, the end result of what uh, we're trying to do from growth is to enhance welfare anyway. But I think right now uh, we've got to sacrifice a bit and create more growth and then look at enhancement as we go down the line. Um, and that is the reason why I, I tend to believe that given the kinds of shock that we have had uh, recently, uh, we've got to start looking into uh, redeveloping our creativity and productiveness and get back to our feet before we really start to say, well, who's going to get what? Um, now we look at the two other questions, uh, the effects of um, the natural disasters and, and the 1987 political uh, events were sort of similar. Yes, they are similar uh, from the results that I've got. Um, but remember, 87 uh, events were one-off. It was the first one. And if you look at and if you compare the effects of that with other political um, situations in the country, you'll find econometrically um, the effects of 87 would be much larger than the effects of any other. I mean, the results will show you on growth. Now, um, so so that's that's the kind of a similar impact that you are seeing. But but it's true that uh, natural disasters will have um, you know a, a more uh, larger effect initially due to a um, lot of uh, capital projects being coming on. But I think um, that kind of impact uh, cannot be uh, totally appreciated to a large extent because it's just a replacement of what we have lost. Uh, however, if the replacement is more um, productivity-based or more uh, advanced in terms of technology and all that, then probably there is something to <coughs> cherish. I, I cannot trade off the strife and uh, difficulties that we had to go through against the new developments that may, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, provide some relief. So um, that's uh, on that question. Now coming back to whether the fiscal stance is appropriate on to managing risks of external sector and, and external sector risk. Um, I think if you look at the budget uh, last and the one that we just had, um, uh, we are moving to the direction in which we were trying to be more uh, domestically driven, more resilient, uh, and, and more to uh, mitigate some of these uh, negative consequences. It's very hard to avoid. 
Um, I, I can't suggest that um, you know um, we will see less of cyclones or any other thing because climate change will have bigger impact on us in the future to come. So uh, I think we are moving in the direction of, of, of getting people and our populations to be better prepared and, uh, for these negative things and on top of that be more si resilient in terms of how they manage their um, incomes and livelihoods. Um, so, so that's the response. And now with money on the control uh, Right. Uh, there's quite a few in here. There's about 12 or so from Top Three Income Group, uh, Control, Decide for that, uh, household expenditure, size of the household, age of the household head, even age of the square to, to show the older people's dependency, whole series, female household head, if there's a female household head, what would be the impact, mm -hmm. education of the household, and all like things like how many children are in the family, you, elderly people, uh, total remittances in terms of, um, in total aspect as well, and non-farm income if they have received anything, if they're living in rural areas. So there's a whole series which controls for that, and then I put the impact on each one. And your paper's <coughs> uh, online yet, or is it working? No, no, not yet. It's still in the almost three-quarter draft. Uh, done. Great, but it will be at some stage. Oh, yes, <laughs> Great. So we'll go to another round of questions. I saw in the corner here, and then we'll come over to this side. Can I have actually three questions? And uh, focus, three on, focus on group. Uh, very <laughs> short three questions. Keep short. Thanks, yes. Matt. The first one is uh, on the forecast. I think it's too bullish because, uh, first of all, the first rule of forecasting is you don't produce forecast without confidence bands. The other thing is that the more you forecast, the more inaccurate you become over time. So basically, I'm trying to look at whether at 2020 or 2025, we'll still have 4% growth given that growth is cyclical. And once we are already growing for five years, we will see a dip some point in time. And how fast we raise from the dip is going to be another question. The other one is on debt finance. You mentioned that uh, there is a problem that we sh uh, something related to that the government should refrain from financing uh, its budget through debt. But my question is, what is the problem when most of the budget is spent on infrastructure, which is capital expenditure? And the last question is that what would be the other counter-cyclical policies that uh, you would suggest in order to maintain that growth momentum or make it resilient over time? That's all. Okay, short but uh, big in um, breadth. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll get two more. So, so in, the in the far Thank corner. Thanks, yeah. Um, question to you um, about your you know, growth enhancing issue. I think I agree with you. Uh, we need um, uh, growth promotion strategies. But you know, uh, if you look at the, um, if, you, if you analyze the um, you know, economic data for Fiji in the last five or four years, uh, you would find a lot of this, uh, you know, growth momentum has been gained through, you know, government expenditures, infrastructure and so on. So how do you really factor that in? Even if you look at the employment data by sector, you will see that. So, you know, that's a bit troubling. But, but I agree with your positive, you know, uh, aspect of, you know, growth enhancing, you know, strategies. Um, another question is for uh, Sally. Do you think the government, uh, current government, is serious about SMEs? So I know five. previous governments were. We'll take this five, but then we'll come to another round of. So we'll, we'll come back to you. Go we'll to this panel first, and we'll do another round of questions. So um, you've got a, a group. You've got a, a bunch more to yeah. answer. Uh, yeah, we'll come around to you again. We'll do okay, another so round. Hang on. Yeah, just hang. Just hold on. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, on the group forecast, um, should we be made um, without confidence bands? Agreed to you there. Um, and I, I think I remember saying that uh, that I'm looking at 4.2 in 2025 with uh, confidence level uh, maximum 4.9, minimum 3.5. So I did provide the band. Um, on debt financing, we know that a small vulnerable economy like ours cannot be over dependent on on debt. So uh, while I totally agree that um, currently that's the stance the government is taking, but any government would do the same given the situation right now. Um, it's not politically uh, viable to increase income taxes, um, you know the reasons, and, um, and, and, and the economy is faced with difficult situations, so again, that's, that's not, not a question right now. Um, so currently, uh, if you want to do and, and, and explore into developing and, and rebuilding the economy, um, we, are, we are thankful to our development partners uh, who have been funding a lot of these development projects going on, but ultimately government will have to um, 
to do the expenditure and get done, it seems to be the option right now. Mm -hmm. But my comment is, um, as we progress with good growth to come, we will have to move away from debt <coughs> into other forms of government finances. Now, other policies that, um, that, that could be implemented to, to get that momentum of growth, I think I've mentioned a number of that build around productivity, innovation. Uh, I'm not really convinced uh, by Sally's comments on that, and the microfinance schemes are, are not working too well. I want to put some co uh, perspective to that. Com compare this to the situation in Vanuatu. I've just been there, I've seen a lot in Vanuatu where we require so much of microfinance and other investment options, but nothing is coming. And people are really uh, finding hard time. The domestic residents who can do so much, they have resources, <coughs> but they can't explore it. We are still better off here. Uh, there's something coming in on board to help us do things that we could otherwise uh, may not be able to do. But I really appreciate the, 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 the comment that uh, 1000 is it enough? I don't know what can we do with $1,000. Um, and who's getting it? I don't know either. Um, but that 1000 seems to be so little to really make a meaningful impact from from domestic uh, sort of microfinance. Um, it's, it's safe to note that things are not working, so probably uh, the, the government and the ministry concerned will be looking around that to see why things are not working. And I'm sure it, it won't take a lot of time to explore why things are not working. And the reforms and all that which is targeted to be in place will address some of these things. Um, so government expenditure led growth. Yeah, a government expenditure-led growth to me this question, uh, and also consumption-led growth, which we are seeing right now, um, uh, is actually taking place. But uh, given the kinds of investment that, that we are seeing in our infrastructure going in right now, and, and potentially more to come, uh, will surely lead to, to growth. And how do we control that in the estimations that we have done? I've put in a number of control variables in place, not just growth as a function of uh, you know old, uh, disasters and all that. But um, uh, government share on infrastructure expenditure, trade, uh, government cap, uh, current expenditure as well, um, <coughs> uh, trade openers, and, and a couple of other things which have gone into the modeling before I can quantify with any, uh, uh, with any certainty the kind of impact that, that we might have seen. That's a common thing that we that we've got to do when we do um, analysis. And I was shocked to see um, Rukmani's long list of <laughs> control variables. That's the usual thing. So, um, and I think, uh, you know, all this, all this big um, spending that we are seeing, which is to rebuild the economy, is a, it's a step forward to, to ensure that we are, we are um, going towards the right direction. And will your assumptions and modeling be available <coughs> in paper? Or yes, um, but at a later stage, right now, it's too much sure. uh, to handle. Thank you. And uh, Sally, the last question on is the government serious? Well, I guess uh, the fact that the uh, government made an announcement in the last budget about the establishment of the SME Corporation, it shows that the thinking is towards some work to redevelop what is already done in the past, particularly NCSMD, the National Centre, was created by the Ngarisa government. Now we have a new government that is looking at the same thing, perhaps changing the clothing of the actual <laughs> that will be. But, but now, now uh, what is needed is the legal framework, the policy and the whole systems need to be relooked at in order for this SME corporation to work. Otherwise, the same story, same story. The comment by Rub about microfinance. This is my point. Uh, One hundred thousand dollars in the bank for SME does not make any implication or effect on that person unless there is some meaningful development on that money. And a lot of people are just being encouraged and saving, and it's there. It makes them no good. My mother has a bank account. She died at seventy-two years old. She had one thousand dollars. Still poor, hungry with no house. So the fact that there's an element about small business development and it comes to business ideas, and that's something that we are definitely lacking. Uh, we do not have bankable ideas. We need to have uh, the assistance from uh, perhaps outside to give us this idea so that we move away from the business cannibalism or the copycat nature that has affected the industry. Thank you. Okay, we'll come to, we'll go to uh, just a quick question, because I don't know. Um, if the Fijian government taxes remittances, and if no, is there any plans 
to introduce that tax. Okay. Um, and so do we have any final qu burning questions? Um, thank you all for the presentation. I have one for Ru. Um, forgive me for my ignorance as a non-economist, but I noticed on your growth and volatility in the past sort of leading up, I was just wondering, um, the pre-devaluation of the dollar and post, how much of this will, um, has had an impact on growth and volatility um, and the outlook for the medium term? You've raised a lot of things in your presentation, but I am wondering, just looking at your graphs and taking it um, on the screen, the, whether the value of the Fiji dollar should something influence that even more so, either going back to pre-devaluation, how much of an impact would this have in the medium term? My question is really to Asel on the idea of incubation. What are ideas thought on incubation and how it could work? Three ideas. So incubation. Six. Six. Uh, on the, I don't think they tax remittances. It's no. the fee that is just charged by the bank mm. uh, in that way. It's not a part of an income which you earn to be taxed. So remittances. Oh, that's because of the mechanism no. taxes, anything that comes in through the bank in addition to what the bank charges. So I was just curious. No, in Fiji it doesn't, and I've not heard of it happening in the Pacific Islands mm. at all, but it's, it will be interesting to see the Jamaican case yeah. and uh, compare that to double, in terms double of taxation. double taxation. That's right. Actually, yeah. mm -hmm. so. I can just comment on the Tonga just introduced last year financial tax. Oh, that. So they are this is the maximum remittances. Latest report is $73 billion. Now, five years ago, the finance minister thought you would introduce a tax on remittances. The government fell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> so we'll jump on to the exchange. I think there was a question yeah, on the exchange. Yeah, exchange. yeah, I think there is one question, right? Yeah. Even one question, but then I'm happy to receive so many questions today. <laughs> um, uh, there's, uh, there's a pre devaluation and post devaluation uh, situation that have been different. I did not think about that when I was doing it, but it can be computed. Um, now, on, on, the, on the point whether devaluation would make any difference uh, in terms of projections, um, let us think if there will be another devaluation. I don't think, yes, there won't be any other devaluation as far as I can see. So, um, and, and there's no reason to do that, technically. Yeah. I've shown you the exchange rate, um, it's kind of stable. And uh, the real economic exchange rate. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, I think the bigger problem is that there are structural problems in the export sector. We are unable to produce and export, and, and obviously we need to find out why. Um, we have got new trade policy framework in place, so there is, uh, the framework is there. We have uh, people starting to engage in commercial agriculture and export. But we are not really seeing the exports um, growing recently. So obviously something is, is, is not right. Um, we, we do, we're not seeing uh, exports to grow in a manner that we want. Um, luckily our um, reserves position is stable. So obviously there are structural problems. Now will uh, devaluation improve our uh, net exports? The answer is yes, it will be. Um, there is a phenomenon called J curve effect, and if you devalue the currency, you will see its impact to pass through around uh, up to about three, four, five years. So um, you'll see uh, an improvement in net export, but you cannot bank on it forever, like because there are structural um, issues to be dealt with. Thank you. Mission incubation. I feel that if we cannot uh, box the solution because of the conditions that are. Uh, on the ground. Uh, case in point, here in Raki Raki, we tried this uh, concept some years ago and they were involved in uh, beekeeping. And uh, we were trying to toss the idea of virtual incubation or setting up a facility. And uh, we ended up in having a virtual uh, incubator where the staff from the National Center goes there and uh, help the ground. But uh, again, it will depend on the needs on the ground. 
if it's going to be supply or they need, you'll ask the people whether they need uh, office space or they will need mentoring. So these are the kind of things that are offered in the uh, incubation center. And there are some uh, conditions that uh, one will need to consider when establishing business to be. One is their closeness to the market, two, their closeness to uh, large suppliers as well as uh, the close proximity to large institutions or universities. Great. That's, that's great. Um, it's been a very vibrant discussion and I, I certainly have learned a lot, so thank you to all of our panellists. Just two pieces of housekeeping. I hope everyone can make it to the closing session that's just about to get started. And also a reminder that you have feedback forms in your, um, in your briefing packs. No conference is perfect and that's how we can make it better next year. So please fill it out and hand it back to the reception. So uh, we just, a round of applause for our speakers again.